um, greetings everyone uh, our team onion growth is here with yet another interesting session with anisha shikha on the path to better health starting with your vagus nerve uh, tanisha is from toronto canada and holds an uh, undergraduate degree in biomedical science and a master's degree in biotechnology both from the university of kerala she is currently on a journey to completing her naturopathic medical degree at Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine. As a sufferer of, sufferer of irritable bowel syndrome, Tanisha has had a keen interest in digestive health and the role that the stress and anxiety plays on the gut-brain axis for as long as she could remember. <laughs> While completing her master's degree, she decided to focus her attention on the topic of gut microbiota and conducted a literature review on the effects of probiotics on gut dysbiosis as a result of excessive antibiotic use. Additionally, she recently had the opportunity to complete a scoping review to identify effective nutritional interventions for the prevention and treatment of anxiety. These research opportunities, along with her own altered gut experiences, have sparked an interest and curiosity for further, to further her knowledge in this field of study. As an avid podcast listener, Tanisha stumbled upon a talk by Dr. Uh, Nawaz Habib, where he dove into the topic of vagus nerve and how we can activate it and use it to reduce pain, control inflammation, and improve our overall health and well-being. She is excited to share the information that she has learned and to talk about free exercises and activities that she uses daily in her routine to activate the vagus nerve. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Yeah, I'm so excited to be here to talk about this topic that has been of particular interest to me for the past couple of months now. With COVID, with this whole pandemic situation, many, if not all aspects of our lives have been impacted in one way or another. And so for me, one of these aspects was actually going to the gym. Um, so in Toronto, Canada here, the gyms have more or less been closed for over a year now. And so to stay fit, one of the things that I've been doing is going on walks and listening to podcasts. And so like you mentioned, I came across Dr. Navaz Habib's uh, podcast a couple months ago back in December and just fell in love with this topic of the vagus nerve. I knew a little bit about it, but just doing my own research and listening to his, ta- uh, to his podcast, I started to learn more about uh, the vagus nerve and its relationship to pain, inflammation, and chronic disease, and how we can implement activities and techniques into our daily lives to activate that vagus nerve and shift from a more sympathetic stress state to a more parasympathetic relaxed state. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today, and I hope you learned something. So if you have a basic understanding in science or you know what the vagus nerve is, then this might be a refresher, but if not, um, this might be a little bit of a summary. So the vagus nerve is the 10th cranial nerve of 12 cranial nerves that we have. And what makes it unique is that in Latin, vagus means to wander or the wanderer, and it fits its function perfectly because it's actually the only cranial nerve that exits our cranial cavity, so our head area, and descends downwards. And so as it descends and makes its way downwards, it innervates or provides that nerve supply to many organs and um, body parts. So as it goes down, uh, we have two of them. It innervates areas of the throat, so it would be like the carotid sinus, carotid body, um, the voice box in the thorax or that chest cavity. It can innervate or it innervates the lung, the heart, and then in the abdomen area, it innervates the liver, large intestine, small intestine. So essentially any organ that you can think of, the vagus nerve probably innervates it. And so you've probably heard about Uh, the term gut-brain connection or the gut-brain axis, while the vagus nerve is actually that physical connection. And I think of it as like that communication highway between the two areas of the body. So when I started, when I learned about the vagus nerve, I thought that the main communication was from the brain sending input to the gut. When in fact, there's research shown that 80 to 90% of that communication actually comes from the gut to the brain. So it's more of that sensory input and only 10 to 20% of the output or that reaction to our environment comes from the brain uh, to the gut. And this uh, this output from the brain is part of that parasympathetic, um, from the parasympathetic nervous system. So 
uh, this output from the parasympathetic nervous system is to ensure that our bodies uh, remain in that state of uh, calm and that like relaxed rest and digest state. So quick summary of the autonomic nervous system. So the autonomic nervous system, we have uh, the, um, the peripheral and um, so we have the central and the peripheral nervous system and that peripheral nervous system has the autonomic system which is uh, part of which, which branches down into the parasympathetic and sympathetic system, right? So the sympathetic is part of that fight or flight response and the parasympathetic is part of that rest and digest. So uh, the autonomic system is not under our conscious control. We don't voluntarily you know, control our breath and our heartbeat or the food that we digest. So it's not under our conscious control. And these, the parasympathetic and sympathetic system are essential for survival. And the sympathetic was essential for survival back in the day because we needed that sympathetic system to stay alert, be aware of our surroundings and our predators. But now we don't need to be in that survival mode all the time. And in fact, we shouldn't be in the sympathetic state 80 to 90% of the day. So as I mentioned, the vagus nerve is that communication between the gut and the brain. So the main function of the vagus nerve is to modulate and control inflammation. And inflammation lies at the root of most chronic diseases. Um, acute inflammation or that acute inflammatory response is needed and is essential for that normal healing process. So when you take a paper cut or a burn, for example, there are a couple of things that the body um, goes through to ensure that we don't die essentially. So the first response is um, when you get that cut, the first response is to create a plug to make sure that we don't bleed out completely. The second response is to increase blood flow to that area of damage. And then with that blood flow, it brings in different um, cells of the immune system. So, you know, leukocytes, neutrophils, macrophages, all of that to help clear out that damage and to make sure that everything's going okay in that area. So you might also notice with that increase in blood flow and recruiting of cells, you'll notice that that area is warm to the touch or it's red. So that's all part of that healthy uh, acute inflammatory response. However, if our bodies, once you know the, the, the cut is healed and everything, once if our body is unable to turn off that inflammatory response, then that inflammation continues to take place over a long period of time, so chronically. And you know we're supposed to be in that state of homeostasis. So if we're in that imbalance, over time that inflammation can cause damage to our organ systems. And that's when we see different disease processes start developing like type two diabetes, uh, atherosclerosis, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, eczema even. And it's shown that allergies are related to that chronic inflammatory uh, state. So the vagus nerve, as I mentioned, helps to facilitate the communication between the body and you know the, the site of damage and the uh, so, so basically everything else to, so the vagus nerve, uh, the brain essentially sends acetylcholine through the vagus nerve to uh, help control that inflammation. So acetylcholine is that main neurotransmitter that the brain sends. And if our body is unable to send acetylcholine out, then uh, we're not able to put that break on the inflammation. And that's when you see the rising levels of inflammation and you see all these disease processes start to, to develop. So in summary, we have the acetylcholine, which is released by the brain and travels through that vagus nerve to moderate and modulate that inflammation. So there's countless studies out there that show the um, important relationship between the vagus nerve and the role that it plays in mental health. And that's kind of what I took an interest to when I started listening to these podcasts. So as I mentioned, we've talked about that gut-brain axis and that connection. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the gut. So the gut is, maybe you've heard that it's considered the second brain. It's part of that enteric nervous system and, you know, helps to control the, um, the digestive processes in our body. Um, so the gut microbiota, it contributes to the proper functioning and stability of that blood gut barrier. So I'm sure you've probably heard of the blood brain barrier, which is over here. And um, it's made up of those tight epithelial, the tight junctions to prevent things from the unwanted things essentially from coming into the blood to the brain and vice versa. So just like that, we have the blood gut barrier, which again, it's made up of cells that have tight junctions that prevent things from entering that that shouldn't. So when we are exposed to different 
things like stress, poor diet, um, alcohol, if we're you know constantly exposed to infections or taking a bunch of antibiotics, overall, this these type of factors will disrupt that blood gut barrier and make that barrier more permeable. And so those tight junctions are no longer tight. They're kind of loose. So things start coming into the blood that shouldn't. And that's when that term leaky gut comes into play. So it's not, I don't think it's an actual medical condition, but there's a lot of research that supports the evidence that inflammation causes disruption to the, to the blood gut barrier and increases the permeability. So this, this diagram here, like it, it just demonstrates what I just explained, where you have the tight junctions in a normal functioning gut, and through stress, uh, diet, smoke, you know, smoking, poor lifestyle choices, all of these start uh, causing damage to that uh, barrier, and you get increased permeability. The, the tight junctions are no longer tight, and so things start entering the blood, such as food allergens, pathogens, and then they start going into the blood. Sorry, into the blood. So when you go, when we go back to this diagram, uh, as I mentioned, we have, you know, these poor lifestyle choices, like the stress and all that kind of stuff that increase the permeability in the gut and starts triggering an inflammatory response. So our immune system, we have that innate and adaptive uh, in immunity. So the innate immunity, I think of it as like a crying baby. So whenever, you know, something goes wrong, the first thing it does is cry. So it's kind of like that, our immune system, whenever uh, at the innate immune system, whenever it senses any sort of insult or damage to the body, the first thing it does is just in increase inflammation. So I talked about that paper cut. The first thing it does is increase that blood flow, bring cells. There's a lot of chaos and destruction kind of happening at the same time. So when we are exposed to stress and poor lifestyle habits, um, it increases that inflammation because it's part of that innate immune, uh, innate inflammatory response. And so one thing I particularly want to highlight is stress. And that's why I think it relates so perfectly to our current situation. Um, stress can have a profound impact on the development of the intestinal barrier, and it's been shown to increase permeability. So when there's an increase in this permeability, as I mentioned, there's that release of inflammation or inflammatory cytokines. And you can see in this diagram here, these inflammatory cytokines go up to the brain and trigger a cascade of events, which essentially causes the body to release cortisol. And cortisol has profound impacts on the body and especially the gut. So it affects the uh, gut motility. It increases gut motility. So I'm sure maybe you've experienced this or maybe you know someone else where they're kind of nervous or they're anxious, they're stressed, and then they start going to the bathroom a lot more. So that's kind of that impact that cortisol has on the, on, on the, um, the gut muscles. And on top of that, it also decreases your immunity. So it's just a vicious cycle of your stress which causes inflammation and damage to that gut membrane and then causes the membrane to uh, increase and release inflammatory cytokines, which then goes to the brain, releases cortisol from the body, and then cortisol goes back and damages the gut even more. So it's just that constant cycle. And there is a, there's a study that I saw where they had people two different groups of people um, in an acute stress, stress environment. So it was a public speaking event, I believe. And they showed that both of these individuals or both of these groups of people had um, th that, that stress. But if you're able to control that cortisol levels, it, it doesn't damage the, the, the intestinal permeability as much versus the people who were unable to control their stress and their cortisol levels, which then damaged the intestinal permeability even more. So I think this relates so perfectly to the pandemic COVID situation, because I mentioned that generally you should be in a state of like that parasympathetic rest and digest state 80 to 90% of the time. And we shouldn't be in that survival mode anymore. Yet I feel like with this pandemic situation, personally speaking, when we went into lockdown last year, I, some of the stresses went away because I didn't have to commute to school every day. So I saved time in that sense, but it also added so much more other stressors. Like when we moved to online learning, there was that, that aspect of independent learning. I didn't have that luxury to talk to classmates or my, or my teachers when I had questions. Um, on top of that, there's all that uncertainty about the future, about work. So I'm sure everyone can, can relate 
to the fact that COVID has increased stress in our lives. And we're probably in a state of that sympathetic stress state more than we should be. So I think more than ever, we should be, we should start improving our health and implementing ways to stimulate that vagus nerve and increase our vagal tone in order to, you know, help our bodies when, when we realize that we're shifting into that state of stress to implement these tools and techniques to kind of move back from that state of stress into a more calm parasympathetic state. So as I mentioned, um, Dr. Navaz Habib, he talked about 19 different ways to stimulate and activate the vagus nerve. And there are so many, I'm not gonna talk about all of them, but so many of these exercises are so simple, yet I feel like they're quite, they're overlooked because of our busy daily lives. For example, he talked about really taking the time to sit down and chew our meals. But I feel like me personally, I don't really do that because I'm always multitasking and watching lecture videos while eating. So there's just so many things that we can do to really just take that time to put ourselves in that parasympathetic state. So I wanted to talk about two. I was going to talk about three, but I'm going to stick to two today. Um, the first thing that I've been implementing to, into my daily routine uh, for the past couple of months now is deep breathing exercise or like that belly breathing. So you know, you can check how you're breathing right now by just putting one hand on your chest, one hand on your on your belly and seeing which hand moves more. And if you find yourself with like your your chest hand moving more, that's technically not the right way to breathe because you're using your accessory muscles. So your chest, your back, your shoulders, those type of muscles you generally use when you're in a state of um, adrenaline. Like if you are running sprints or you're, you know, running a marathon, you're using those accessory muscles to get in that extra bit of oxygen into our bodies. But we're not running a marathon right now. Like we're just sitting, we're relaxed. So we should be using our belly to, our, and our abdominal muscles to bring in that air. So, um, so what you can do right now, if you want, you could just sit up and make sure that when you're breathing, you're not moving your uh, shoulders and you're, when you're breathing, you're sticking your tummy out. And so I've been implementing these techniques into my daily routine, like, especially when I find myself shifting into that, like I'm a little anxious, I can feel myself getting a little stressed out, or, you know, right before midterm, I take the time to just take a step back and do those deep breaths. And I do maybe five to eight of those. And I feel immediately myself just go into that from that stress state into a more relaxed state. And so I'm sure maybe you've heard of this term box breathing where, um, so it's this, it's this image here. You can also look up YouTube videos where they guide you through the box breathing technique. And it's essentially just implementing this deep breathing belly, be belly breathing technique where you inhale for four seconds and stick your tummy out, hold that for four, exhale for four, and then hold that exhale for four seconds. And if you, if you try that for yourself, you might, you, you, you might see that difference in going from that, you know, stressed, uh, breathing fast, heart rates kind of high to a more relaxed state. And if you're not used to this, this might feel a little weird and you might actually find yourself getting out of breath, but just like with anything, it takes practice and you just, your body's not used to it. So you'll get used to it. And the other thing that I've been implementing is uh, cold showers. So cold showers have tremendous impacts and benefits for the hair, the skin. It helps with uh, reducing muscle soreness and fatigue post-workout, but it's also shown that exposing your body to acute cold situations, so not just cold showers, but maybe even going outside in the wintertime without a jacket, all of these have an impact and activate the vagus nerve and activate these cholinergic neurons. So going back, I talked about acetylcholine, right? So acetylcholine releases and kind of decreases that inflammatory response. So research has shown that uh, exposing yourself to cold on a regular basis lowers that fight or flight response and increases that rest and digest response. So for me, I hate cold. I'm, a, I'm generally a cold person. So this was a little bit different, difficult for me to implement, but um, so how I started was I started with splashing my face with cold water every day and that really, you know, helped wake me up. And um, eventually after a hot shower, I started uh, taking like a one minute cold shower at the end. And I started with lukewarm water and like slowly made my way up. So that's how I've been implementing cold showers and it's helped me quite a bit. Um, there's so many other things like I've 
there's uh, like a uh, acupuncture, there's, as I mentioned before, there's the humming, laughter, all of these implement or activate your vagus nerve. So that's all I have for today. Um, if you have any questions, you can always connect with me on Instagram. And yeah. Thank you. That was a lovely uh, briefing for uh, this one. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. Um, my question is, um, how did you, uh, how was your early phase before discovering all this? How did you manage uh, with IBS? With IBS? Yeah. Oh, it was a long journey. I'm still on that journey right now. Um, so for me, for me, a lot of my IBS triggers, it was stress and anxiety. So it was actually when I started naturopathic medical school last year um, that I started really implementing techniques to manage my stress. So before managing my stress was going to the gym, as I mentioned. Um, so that helped a lot, but it was more so I would, I'm a worrier, I overthink. And so I've started, so this is when I started implementing the box breathing. Um, there's different techniques that I use to just bring myself back into, uh, like basically bring myself back into the present instead of worrying about the past. And then uh, my diet as well. So I, being from an Indian background, I eat roti chapati like every day, right? So I didn't know that those were the triggers for my IBS issues. It was more of the food sensitivity. And I mentioned that, you know, stress and all those things start damaging your gut and that increasing the permeability. So I, over the past year and a half now, I've been implementing techniques to help with dealing with stress and anxiety. I'm still not at 100%, but I feel like I'm a lot better. And then taking different supplements to help really heal my gut, because I feel like I've done a lot of damage, um, you know, from prior antibiotic use and just constantly getting sick and resorting to medication. So I feel like all of those in total have damaged my gut a little bit. And also the foods. I, so there's different foods that can can increase inflammation in your body. So I didn't realize all those. And so once I started learning more, I started removing them out of my diet, really eating foods that nourished my body, nourished my gut, taking supplements. And um, for me, one of the triggers for my food was gluten. Have you heard of gluten, right? Yeah, gluten and um, certain, certain beans like chickpeas and stuff. So I know now that those foods hurt my body and like broccoli and all that. Like I love broccoli. I love those types of foods, but I just eat them in moderation. So I'm more aware of what foods hurt my body and what foods benefit it. And I don't completely cut them out, but I just, I know my limit now. I still work. I still have my moments where I eat too much. And then after my stomach doesn't feel great, but it's, it's a learning process. So I'm not a hundred percent fixed, but it's always, you learn more and you, you just kind of experiment with your body. So yeah. Tell me about your experience in natural Sorry, I didn't hear you. Tell me about your experience at naturopathic school. In medical, in naturopathic medical school? Yeah. Oh, it's been, it's been great. So the first year I started last year. So last year was when I was in person. And so this past year in my second year has been online, which has been interesting to say the least because second year is when we really uh, get our hands-on experience you know we get our acupuncture our physical like clinical diagnosis uh, course where we do physical exams so we didn't really have the opportunity to get most of that hands-on experience but I'm totally enjoying I'm enjoying it so much the information I'm just loving it because it's you have the biomedical science courses right? You have physiology, anatomy, all that kind of stuff. And then you have like acupuncture, traditional Chinese medicine, botanical medicine. So it's been, it's been great. It's so much information, but it's like, I'm enjoying what I'm learning and I'm able to apply it on myself and see, I'm kind of like my own guinea pig to see what things, what techniques, different things I learn, how it can help me with my, with my body and my healing. So yeah. So like the other day I hurt my ankle and instead of taking pain medication, I was like, Ooh, let me try hydrotherapy and like, let me try acupuncture and, and, you know, massage techniques to improve blood flow and lymphatic drainage. It's just, it's, just, it's great. It's, and then I get to practice on my family too. So 
I'm loving it. Totally. The same happened here too. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, uh, what field do you think interests you more? I sorry, I can't hear you. Could uh, you bring yeah. the yeah. mic closer? Uh, is it uh, better right now? Um, if you just bring the mic a little bit closer to your... Is it better right now? A little bit, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what specialization do you like so much? Like, is it mental health or is it... Uh, <laughs> for me, digestive, digestive health, for sure. <laughs> it's It's been... You, you probably have heard, like learned it by now. I have just a huge interest in digestive health because of my own con conditions. And I think a lot of my family members, my family, we all have similar digestive concerns and friends as well. So I've, I feel like I've just been surrounded by that all my life. And for me, like when I had, when I started developing my, my um, digestion problems, it happened a couple of years ago after I took a huge round of antibiotics. And then, you know, I had a lot of different um, stressors in my life that just contributed to my overall gut imbalance. So since then, I, I just always like, I always wondered if this is how I'm going to have to live my life now. But then through naturopathic medicine, I realized like, it's, you don't just have to, this is not something that you have to just, you know, be used to it's, this isn't your normal anymore. Like you can get better. And so once I started seeing improvements in my health, I just felt so empowered that like all these years I was told that I can't really, there's not really much I can do. I just have to manage my stress, but like managing your stress is just one aspect of like so many different things. Right. So I, and, and, and that's like the beauty of digestive health. It's not just your, your gut, it's everything. Like it's your hormones, it's your, your mental health, your overall like well being. There's so many different factors. So even though I say digestive health, I, I guess I just mean like everything. Cause so many different factors play into the development and like the proper functioning of your gut, because your gut is your second brain. If you don't, if your if your gut's not working well, overall, it's just nothing's like, it's just an imbalance with everything else. Right. So yeah. So digestive health has been I think it's going to be my, uh, it's what I want to specialize in or what I want to focus on more. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, so before we conclude, would you like to give some passing comments? And some, some comments? Yeah. Um, about what? What do you want me to talk about? Before ending this, something uh, that you want to uh, share with the viewers of this video to look on. Um, well, I am not an expert on this topic. I'm always learning more, and I'm and I and I feel like you know we learn best by sharing information with one another. So if if anyone who's watching this has more information on the vagus nerve and its relationship to different aspects of our health, please reach out to me because I I feel like I'm going to continue researching this topic. It's like it's of interest to me right now and it has been for the past little while now so um yeah so that's all I can say is if you have things that you might know more about this topic please reach out to me because I'd love to learn more lovely lovely because there's a lot of people here also they are uh, you know working on the same yeah and, uh, yeah so you know it's all pieces of the puzzle right so we all just learn more and contribute to each other and we yeah we get a better understanding of the topic so yeah. Thank you for coming on. Thank you so much. Platform, uh, accepting our request and giving us your uh, Of course, I had so much fun <laughs> chatting about this today. So thank you. Thank you so much. Perfect. Take care. Bye.